Welcome to the call for 30th of June, last call of phase three in Open Active. Um, as I said uh, just before starting recording, we will be continuing these calls into phase four. Um, but thank you all for joining. Uh, this will be um, kind of a retro call. It's really just going to be going over the major milestones that were accomplished in phase three and just really opening up for comment after that and maybe flagging points of difficulty or questions or uh, desires for agenda setting moving forward um, that don't have another forum at the moment uh, to express those in. Um, before I start, however, if we could just go around the screen, um, I'll proceed uh, clockwise from my view and I'll just call upon each of you in turn to introduce yourselves. Uh, first of all, Charlie Clark. Uh, hi guys, Charlie, um, commercial director um, and technical pretender from Flowers. Thank you, Charlie. Um, I am Tim Hill uh, of the Open Data Institute. Um, I guess as of tomorrow, I will be project lead for the Open Data Institute on Open Active. Um, Jason. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Jason, uh, working with Tim from the Open Data Institute, uh, consultant working on Open Active, um, leading on engagement through phase four. Uh, Chris. Hi, I'm Chris from uh, Racefully, Activity Tracking App. Long time lurker, occasional appearance. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Siv. Hi, I'm Siv. Uh, I'm a developer at IMIN. And uh, last but not least, Nick. I'm with my mouth full. Hi, I'm Nick uh, from IMIN. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, terrible timing there. Okay, so I will just uh, start sharing the screen here. Can you all see the open active presentation? Good, excellent, thank you. Um, so essentially what happened in phase three? Um, hopefully we're all fairly clear about this. Um, the headline really is the open booking API that came out near the beginning of phase three um, and is now, I think it's safe to say, um, Approaching maturity, we're on, it's been iterated very quickly, I would say almost throughout the entirety of phase three. Um, it's currently at uh, candidate release number three. Um, it's supported by a test suite, which has been, I suppose, um, maybe not quite bulletproof, but rigorously tested uh, over the last month. Um, so I think it's a, a fairly mature um, specification and uh, should be moved into actual official release soon. Um, also virtual events. Um, this was, I suppose, something that was always on the radar, but obviously COVID made virtual events uh, quite uh, important, moved that up the agenda in importance. And so now we can support both uh, live streaming and uh, recorded virtual events. Uh, there was also the release of the root specification to candidate release one uh, and a proposal covering accessibility that was generated. Um, I think those are the main milestones through phase three, but what stuck out, struck it, uh, what stuck out to other people as uh, major turning points for them? Or is this a complete list? Covers it for me. Okay, cool. Yeah, I agree. Um, but I think we also did a little bit of validator improvements. Um, did we, is, was that in phase three, Tim, the model libraries? Have I forgotten what numbers things are in? You know, we created all those model libraries. Um, I feel like the base was already there. Uh, they didn't have to be created from scratch. Um, they certainly right. bulk the out. PHP and Ruby, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, Language support, that was it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's, that's also, I mean, no, no, it's not quite standards, is it? But that's good. That's good. Yeah, okay, it might be worth adding a sort of point about, about tooling down there, I suppose. Um, okay, so those are, those are the headlines. Um, I think there were several rolling conversations that um, I think <laughs> there was a tendency for issues to kind of surface and resurface and not quite get resolved, which is hardly unique to this particular standards body. Um, 
the below are a list of issues that I think we actually did talk to the point where they can be resolved if somebody, in most cases me, simply does what was agreed upon. Um, however, I'm, I'm happy to see this list expanded. Um, the first is a long rolling discussion about facility type, service type, and venue. So things like uh, squash courts, pitches, and the various surfaces they might have, whether um, a venue is indoors and outdoors, those kinds of three interrelated overlapping but distinct concerns we did get towards completing a model for. Um, and there's an action with me to actually create the JSON structure that would specify that. Um, so that, that I think has got to a point of, of maturity. Um, we also need to do point releases of the data set site specification and the modeling opportunity data specification. A lot of the work on opportunities um, falling out of the work on the open booking API, I think it's safe to say. Um, but that said, are there other issues that people are expecting to see moved forward in the near future that feel like they should be done but aren't? The, the only one from me, um, and I think this is quite small fry and rel relatively booking system specific at the moment, um, but uh, consideration for other opportunity types that aren't specifically specified in the standards as of yet. Um, so yeah. I've got in mind things like competitions, courses, um, anything related to a qualification. Um, uh, competitions from our side is a big one. I think the, the emergence of people completing challenges um, in various formats um, became prevalent during uh, the pandemic, but I think it's a sort of concept that's here to stay um, uh, and aren't yet considered in the standards. So that for me is a, an area of interest um, so that data can be used more widely around those. Okay. Those are data types. Um, that will be coming on to one of those, actually. What worries me is that that list that you have in your head is much longer than the list I had in my head. Um, <laughs> so we'll, <laughs> we'll work on expanding that shortly. Um, Nick. I thought you just let me, Nick. Oh, are you just expecting me to give you a massive list? <laughs> I, I was expecting that. And then it looked to me like you unmuted. So I thought, uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, it, that was probably me putting my sandwich on the keyboard. Um, so I'm just making a big deal about meeting lunch right now. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, no, I think that's a really good summary. Um, the, I, th I think there's quite a lot in that. Well, not a lot, but obviously the, the booking spec we, we talked about has um, been a lot of stuff in there. And the, there's quite a few issues in the data set site and modeling spec to kind of just check through and stuff. So I think those bullet points do actually include a lot of things, yes. I'd assumed. Um, and therefore, What's in the if if we look at the outstanding issues in the various places in those repos of mod booking spec, data set site, and modeling spec, can't think of anything else. A facility types obviously its own repo, so we've kind of covered the four repos in the bullet points. Just handy. Um, yeah, I guess the question is um, whether whether all of those points are sort of talked out. That is a question of basically editing a document now rather than discussing an issue. Um, we can hop onto those repos if that would be of use to people. Um, yeah, let's maybe do a skim through them. Mm. Um, good point. So is everyone seeing the issues list there? Um, uh, great. Um, so I think the question is whether there's any, if there's anything that jumps out at people as, um, needing further discussion i do feel like with some of these what we might need to do is just try and write it do you know what i mean right okay and, then and, we'll when, see. and when we find that we can't quite write it because we haven't fully flushed something out it might just be then that um i mean things like for example publishers versus publisher versus creator that i don't know if we've really got an answer to but we might have at the bottom of that issue kind of concluded something um i thought we did but uh, okay. Any, anything that ends with a weighing up of advantage versus disadvantage is not <laughs> resolved. <laughs> it's, not, it's not quite, but it was close. I feel like, and there's, mm -hmm. uh, and also we probably need to make a decision to, or maybe it's actually implied to stop waiting for this API web API discussion that seems to just be stuck in interminable. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really don't understand what's going on with that. I've chased the guy several times. I mean, I don't know if it's worth a, a final attempt, Tim, from you as. Uh, 
a kind of don't know maybe maybe make your maybe i don't know make your title known or something <laughs> I, yeah and i think also the fact that we're at kind of an inflection point is is helpful to cite as well like you know we would we would love to have this in phase four um yeah however we also want to proceed you know what can we what can we do yeah, yeah that sounds that sounds really useful i mean we've done we've been really successful at lobbying well tim you've been really successful previously lobbying schema for things i think we've got a few different bits in um so yeah be good to get that yeah i can imagine that they're hesitant to move because actually web i feel like not enough people are paying attention to the web api conversation like it's quite a big mm -hmm. chunky thing that a lot of people are going to be interested in once it's out um so they might be a bit hesitant to move for that reason but equally none of those people seem to be engaged so let's proceed uh you know based on the people yeah. who, are, who are focused um and also we can always implement half the fields not the, i mean we don't need all of the fields that they mm. they posed in there um, yeah. so even if they for example just just uh, decided to go with um the the one that references the schema i forget what it's called but there's a um something too uh then that would probably be far, like you know there's probably like a handful that would be really really useful for us like uh, endpoint url or something uh and then the others are less important Okay. What's, what's um, meant? What what's meant by human readable content, which is about two or three up, I think, uh, more human readable content required. Yeah, that's actually about the um, specified. Well, I think it's got two aspects to it. Let me make sure I'm reviewing this correctly. Yeah. Okay. So it's much easier to specify what the JSON content of the dataset splash page should be because that's very easy to, to describe formally. Um, we don't give a lot of guidance about what sort of content is actually expected on a data set site space page, like what you should actually see. So we're good on machine parsable, we're not so good on human readable. Um, so the question is, what should we specify has to be human readable? And then how do we validate whether something is really you know human readable? Yeah, um, Thank so you. I think, yeah, it's just a question of how we how we cope with that. Um, I think I think most of the other ones are more or less resolved. But yes, as Nick says, maybe it's a question of trying to write it down and then realizing I've got no idea what to put in this paragraph. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, and that might bring us back into the headspace because I think we we've really not been in these you know detail in the while yeah yeah um modeling opportunity data um if you go to the project uh tim that might be the the best place to visualize the stuff yeah. yes there's some with this required for open booking tag which are in the under the discussion column yeah. but I mean, I don't think, I mean, I think this is again, one of those things to just look look at right. I think in a lot of cases, actually they have been concluded. Type and ID, for example, has been concluded. Yeah. So shouldn't probably be in a discussion anymore. Um, it's just a good case of checking that those are indeed wherever they, they should be. Um, yeah, I think, uh, well, let's see. Do, do, do. Yeah, oh, ad hoc lo event locations. Is that one resolved? Mm, not sure. What's it? What is it? Um, I, I think we probably do want everything that's required for open booking to be in the point release, right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't think we want anything in backlog. Yeah. Um, yeah. Agreed. I'm so, not sure exactly why those two are still in backlog. There might just be an oversight. I'm not actually sure whatever ad hoc event locations is off the top of my head. Uh, <laughs> Sure, it's. Oh, oh yes, yeah. of course. This would, yes, because at the moment, just to get your validator to pass, if you've got bike rides, you need to fudge the fields and address. Otherwise, the whole conform, otherwise, the whole test suite breaks. Yeah. Which is a bit nuts. So, I, I mean, that's the thing. We, we probably, these probably aren't really in backlog um, because I think that, that issue actually has been discussed previously. I think there's actually a, a, um, a whole thing on that thread. Okay. So, um... And I think accepted payment method, that's a narrow one that's also solved, isn't it? I think so, yeah. No. Yeah, yeah. These can probably just be moved across. I mean, okay, well, let's let's just put an action to review just to be sure. Um, yeah. But yeah, okay. 
So we're, we're most of the way there. Um, um, issues needing further exploration. Um, okay, so this is where Charlie's uh, shopping list uh, starts becoming relevant. Um, but the first one is memberships um, because these are, oh, hello? Um, so there's a very lengthy proposal um, for how to deal with um, memberships, which are left kind of underspecified in the current um, implementation. Um, I think this is probably going to be what absorbs most of the attention for phase four is getting that integrated into the specification into a way that in a way that suits everybody's requirements. Um, or at least suits the common core of requirements. Um, now, so Charlie mentioned courses as something that needs to be modeled, uh, but then there was a range of other points that you mentioned, Charlie. Can you refresh my memory as to what those are? are? So yeah, this is simply where systems like us will potentially be sort of cheating the standards in some form or fashion, which would be things like competitions, tournaments, leagues, ladders, um, and then event-based competitions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, challenges, um, uh, courses and volunteering opportunities, all of these can. What, what you tend to find with all of these types of activity is um, there is still kind of what I'd consider to be a point of entry for simplicity of language. Um, so yes, a tournament has a draw and it has a progression and it might happen on a day or happen over a few weeks, but that's not really what's important for the standards. What's important is there is an opportunity to enter. And once that point has gone, um, the standards don't particularly care. Um, and that is modeled with a name, a description, a price, um, uh, difficulty, age requirements, etc. But I'm sure there are things about a tournament as an example that um, might be of interest to the standards i we, this is obviously very specific to us so i imagine it's very low on the priority list but um i do wonder we've obviously talked a lot about roots so just wonder with some of these others whether there are system providers out there volunteering springs to mind where there's um a volunteering system called kinetic so i think not to be confused with kinetic insight although there might be some crossover um who provide volunteering systems with opportunities in um, and there's probably other volunteering systems that i am aware of uh, that have volumes of data in them that could plausibly com um, contribute to uh, the open data set. So yeah, these have always been on the back of my mind that we do things and we do publish these as opportunities, but it's thin on the ground in terms of any data specifics and how long we allow that to carry on going. I don't want the gaps to increase for systems like us who um, are just cheating to eventually point at becoming a lot of work to, to uh, patch that gap in two or three years time. Um, I guess, are there issues raised or proposals raised for this? Um, oh, of, course, of course not, Tim. That would require organization, oh. administration. <laughs> so <laughs> can I ask you <laughs> um, to, yeah, to first of all, raise those. Um, probably as fine-grained as you can. Um, so, you know, one, one for competitions, one for challenges, one for volunteering. Um, and then if, so if this is data that you're already publishing, um, at, le at least we can have a very targeted conversation about that, because if you've got an example of that, that you can copy and paste into the, just into the um, issue mm -hmm. and then just illustrate where the modeling problem is, I think we can probably resolve that fairly quickly or at least come to what a sensible solution is pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we have, to, we have to begin with where, where, what the data looks like right now. And Charlie, there's a, already an issue for leagues. Uh, that is definitely uh, of interest to sports, at least, uh, as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, yeah, if you yeah, maybe dig that one out. Yeah, I will. Um, I'll go and dig out with some searches and contribute where I can. Um, yeah, I think there probably is a little marketplace of systems that have probably not quite ever been considered here that it might just be worth us sort of looking at. I don't want it to suddenly think it's a priority because it might come to nothing, um, but uh, could be of interest. Yeah, I think, I think my impression sort of generally talking with various people is is there's lots of stuff that we're not modeling and I, I think the question is not so much whether there's demand it's about how possible it is to you know finally model everything um but yeah I, i'm not worried about there being community interest in it definitely cool. um uh difficulty and intensity this difficulty went round quite a bit 
Um, and I think we landed in a more or less good place, only to have um, a number of organizations come forward with an interest in intensity, <laughs> which is apparently something different. Um, I'm not too sure how to um, cleanly separate the two in a way that makes sense to people who aren't already clear on the distinction, um, with difficulty being about experience and skill and intensity really being about almost more like cardiovascular health. Um, so I think that's one that will probably continue to run. Um, and then I, from... I, imag I imagine there's, there's even a plausible, sorry to be really awkward, but a plausible third there, which is like where we talk about div difficulty, we're talking about the activity. Whereas I imagine in our sector, it's probably more pertinent to be talking about the participant rather than the activity, which might be your, your like, inactive etc like who is this suitable for rather than what difficulty level is it because a participant looking at a difficulty might have no clue whether it's suitable for them or not just because it says beginner or intermediate it might be like you're inactive so this is suitable or you are um, uh, something similar I've always felt that would be a bit of a uh, sort of hard to use field on the front end for, for being fit for purpose in all circumstance yeah and I think that's kind of where intensity is coming out of is it it got flagged in social prescribing and then started popping up everywhere that, yeah, it is, is sort of about participants who are entering into a completely new kind of area, typically because they're really sedentary, um, having a good sense of whether they're going to be capable of undertaking an activity. Um, but yeah, how you communicate that so that people have an accurate sense is, is really difficult. Um, and yeah, maybe maybe having a controlled vocabulary saying, you know, are you sedentary? Are you underactive? Are you active? Or do you want to be more active? I don't know. There might be a frame of words that's more uh, user focused that that um, addresses that better. I, I think there are probably there's probably a good reference point in the the types of survey that uh, activity providers, especially in regards to funding partners, would go out to ask. So. Um, like the, the classic how active are you now and the uh, active lives might be a good place to start where they, they're either referencing like I, I'm not active at all I'm active once a week but there's also sort of uh, yes I am sedentary um, those those because they tend to um, survey at start of program and end of program and I think this is probably all like comes from a greater focus on the inactive over the last two or three years in, in strategy but I think that's only going up not down yeah yeah COVID has not helped at all um okay i will i will add a note on that onto that um onto the relevant issue then yeah um i don't i don't see us immediately picking up this conversation but it certainly needs addressing um that's why we're touching on this uh, I, I i remember the call about difficulties um i can't remember whether we discussed specifically um i was thinking i used to be a, a canoeist and the british canoe union has skill levels, a star level basically, and uh, certain courses or certain competitions would be graded according to for a, for a rating level that I would achieve within a, a formal sort of exam system, if you like, as a canoeist. Um, I'm just, I, I can't remember whether we talked about that. I think cycling maybe has something similar as well. Um, but I, just while we're, just, just a drive by, I didn't want to lose the thought completely. Um, if it's um, it's all useful to the uh, the next time we come back to this. Okay, I will add I will add uh, that comment as well onto the end of that thread. Um, and then the the final point that seemed to keep on coming up and then uh, submerge again um, was safeguarding and instructor qualifications, which are not necessarily the same issue, but sometimes seem to arise in the same kind of conversations um the and we're, we're sort of stymied a little bit with this one um because we don't really have an infrastructure that we can draw upon there are some safeguarding practices that are widespread well even widespread is, is maybe a bit much to say there are some safeguarding qualification uh safeguarding approaches that are used by a substantial number of organizations, um, but it's by no means standardized. And of course, it's a it's a high risk area. Um, 
so it could be that we need to proceed by engaging more closely with organizations like MCR Active um, or initiatives like MCR Active, um, which are dealing with this problem on quite a, um, quite a pragmatic level to try to get a sense of, of what they're trying to support. Um, because this felt like a fertile topic for discussion and it seemed to get more rather than less complicated as we, as we spoke. I, I think there are sort of local models out there to try and accredit um, providers. So um, I don't know what goes on in uh, at MCR Active, but I certainly know Active Westminster have always had the concept of uh, Active Westminster Mark, which was accreditation of quality and um, accreditation to certain legals, governance and other requirements, and would usually be a, a sort of, it's not a certificate, but a marker of, of, um, of safeguarding and qualifications. This comes up on almost every data user initial call that I have. Um, mm -hmm. How do they control who can get on there and how can they be sure the governance of those providers is is in place mm -hmm. so for me it's it is a very high especially perhaps with the the engagement focus priority that might be in place for phase four aligned with active partnerships i think that's going to could end up being a big area of focus because i think it's a, a barrier to entry in not not totally it can be avoided but there's there's certain caution about knowing anyone can publish something that appears on a website that is considered accredited i think taking us i've always felt when i've heard noise in this area that um and i just don't know where this gets managed but uh, the blue tick exercise of social of social media giants is not a bad one it's just working out how that gets how that does get managed um as to something who's just someone who has been validated it's there's an official there is an officialness to to that tick although it might not still indicate absolutely everything um i don't think we're going to get to the point of actual governance checking and check they've got every legal document Mm -hmm. um, but it could be at least be a signature for or, or a label of label of quality that this has been looked at and this other, otherwise this one hasn't. I've worked an awful lot with organisations around kind of quality marks, as it were, but the um, how often certification is is reviewed in because, you know, you know, your safeguarding certificate has to be reviewed every three years. Um, and so does a quality mark. So somebody could be signed off but then a month later their qualification goes out of date but their quality mark stays in date for the next three years so it's, it's just not as live as you would want it to be and things fall through the net unfortunately. Yeah I, th I feel like MCR Active gave us a nice walkthrough of their accreditation system which was mostly focused on safeguarding although it did touch on um, uh, instructor qualifications a little bit um, and my impression at the time was that it was quite thoroughgoing. Um, I think the difficulty was it relied upon a lot of human validation, that there was always a human in the middle who was looking at all of these documents and making sure that they were legitimate and fit for purpose and so on. Um, and I suppose one of the questions for us is how much, how much we want to assume that kind of infrastructure um as it's also the case with the sort of ngb strategy for safeguarding is very heavy very pure you know very pyramid kind of focused um you know with this idea that the ngb accredits you know creates a code of conduct that various organizations organizations sign up to and then their conformance to that is audited by the ngb and so on and so forth down the chain um that's extremely heavy um but whether we can do much more than point to those other kinds of structures that other people put up, like MCR Active or the NGB structure, um, I guess is, is the question. Um, we probably can't create a complete system that handles all safeguarding um, or, or even specify how one works, but maybe, maybe that is a requirement. Um, it sounds like what we need to do is talk to um, active partnerships and other interested parties and get a sense of just how heavy uh, a system we can be expected to support and how, how widespread those are. Is there a role, a future role of SIMSA in that process? Sorry, a future role for? SIMSA. Uh, what worries me is I don't know what you're referring to. I'm looking at Jason. Uh, I wouldn't want to rattle off their whole acronym, but Char Chartered in the, the new Chartered Institute for Official Qualifications in our sector, as far as I understand. Oh. Yeah, they sound relevant. <laughs> um, 
it needs a, it needs an actual sector person. Jason, you're the closest we've got on the call. <laughs> 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 yeah, I haven't had too much involvement with those guys, um, but I'm also aware that I don't think everyone um, is kind of registered with them. So I don't think they hold a database of live um, certifications of all coaches or qualifications of all coaches. That's quite um, individual to, to NGBs um, or different bodies. Yeah, yeah, I certainly know. The only thing I do know is some of their early work, for just crossing over with partners we work with, was about... Um, about creating a much more official, uh, I can't think of the wording at all, so I'm going to have to do layman's terms, but like much more um, official recognition of job roles, job titles, job qualifications, um, et cetera, across the sector, so that what well, it professionalizes the sport and physical activity sector much more um, and recognizes when you have certain uh, qualifications, safeguarding credentials, et cetera. Like they, I think they started as an, as an independent, I don't really know their full journey, I think they started independent and are now supported or funded by Sports England, but they are being recognized recognized as the official sort of they are the ones who will recognize the professional accreditation across the sector it's just they're still only two or three years into their journey so I'm just thinking they feel like the right place were they to be uh, a larger body in the, over the next sort of five or ten years okay I think probably there's two aspects to this because I feel like what we've done in miniature just now is like a compact version of what the conversations previously have looked like which is like sort of ever branching and ever getting larger um, with more people that we should probably be talking to. Um, I think what I will suggest then is that we, first of all, do some kind of data collection exercise to get a sense of how big a priority this is for the sector. Charlie has indicated that it's high. Um, and then I think I want to kick this a little bit up the chain and talk to Sport England about who we should be talking to, actually. Um, and then we can start going from there because this feels like getting a quorum on this is going to be very difficult. Like who, everybody to some extent has got a stake in safeguarding. Um, and who's authoritative to, to talk about it, I think is a difficult question. Um, so that's another action for me. Can I quickly take it up a level um, and just think about what we're trying to achieve with the representation of safeguarding and qualification information in the standard um, and where we, you know, I, I think Open Active wants to be not at all in the circumstances of making any assertions about fitness for purpose of anybody. Um, then the next question is, do the publishers of Open Active's formatted data have, um, uh, sorry, do the originators of it, they, they presumably do have responsibility for any assertion they make about fitness for purpose, but do the republishers, the people who aggregate and, and use that information and put it through in their apps, rather, do we want to structure it such that they basically get a, uh, a buy on that kind of assertion that says this assertion has been made by the organization organizing the event and it's got nothing to do with us and because that would come back to the standard and say, right, well, who's making the assertion? What's this, what is the text of the assertion? And what is the supporting documentation for the assertion? And maybe that's all Open Active needs to do without getting into the weeds of validity and you know, the uh, current, how current it is and that sort of thing, which would make this an awful lot simpler from an Open Active point of view, but maybe uh, at the expense of putting effort onto the publishers to be able to back it up or come up with their own way of backing it up. But it is quite flexible that way. Yeah, I think I think scoping is is the pertinent question. Um, because yeah, it would be it would be easy enough to have some URL fields that said, you know, for instance with NGBs, you know, here's the NGB code of conduct. Here's the membership number of the organization with the NGB. So here is what you can reasonably expect, you know, the validation that they adhere to that code of conduct to be. Um, so that would be, I don't know, two or three URL fields. Um, yeah, and then there's the whole other world of DBS checks and uh, dating and validity stamps and so on and so forth. Um, and yeah, I, I, I agree with you, Chris. I would prefer that we not engage with any of that, um, that that is left to somebody else to, to worry about. Um, but I, 
I, I think it's just a question of getting the scoping right and and validated is is just the first the first step um, because minimal would be great but if if that leaves people with doubts about the initiative as a whole or what's happening to my data, um, obviously something more heavy handed is going to be is going to be required. Um, yeah, I think we just need to guard against trying to build as an accidental addition to this standard a whole <laughs> for sports qualifications. Which would be uh, its own its own thing for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess that's the danger as well. Is is just scope creep? That yeah, phase four standards eat everything. Um, yeah, that's right. Um, um, does anybody else have anything to add to the to the more exploration issues list? These were the four that jumped to the top of mind. I guess I just uh, weigh in with a, uh, an additional vote for continuing to pay attention to virtual stuff. That's my bag, really. Um, and also that, that does lock into uh, uh, Charlie's earlier points about challenges and so on. The virtual challenges, I think, are going to remain uh, post COVID, still something that people have now had a sample of and quite enjoy doing. And it would be good uh, to model that. I noticed that uh, Strava, uh, excuse me, Strava have just released a, a whole challenge capability. There's no API to it at the moment. I just went and checked. Um, but it would seem like, you know, it, there's, there's plenty of those about, and it would be a pity for something that's in the business of in, encouraging people to go and do things. It uh, doesn't have a model that represents those thoroughly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think it also has a way, um, something that I'm exploring with a data user at the moment is a way, a different way to bring Roots data to life. Um, I'm not that familiar with where Open Active is with Roots at the moment, but uh, virtual challenges being something like there is a walk you can do, but rather than just show them the start point, the end point and hope that they go and do it, um, actually getting them using things like devices to go and track their activity because that generates data that can be used for participation impact evidence. So yes, it shows a walking route but every walking route in this country could be something that's then a trackable thing by um, by applications so it just brings the concept of a route to life in a slightly different way rather than readable data it's more engageable data um so i, I think there's definitely a market for that but i'm sure there's apps out there trying to to, to do that but it has a place in open active mm -hmm. Yeah, again covid seems to have brought all of that to the surface i mean all that activity was there before but uh yeah it's much much more visible than it was um my, my last point uh, just going back to the safeguarding one would be um the barriers to entry for certain markets so something like a a school um as, as a as a single example becoming a data user without without some quality control um I, I think it goes beyond governance accreditation qualifications i just think it becomes for me it becomes almost a boolean tick box that some somehow something's getting populated to guide a data user who is otherwise um null and void on on what the data is to prove quality because otherwise if they use all data someone in some system can go and put up an activity that attracts uh, families or young people towards them for subversive requirements I'm thinking that's a that's a worst case requirement but um without something in the data i think there are services that could overlay open active that do that and hat pickers i know i'm in provide services like that but um it's how even then how do you know that there's a sense of quality or an accredited provider just that somebody with some authority somewhere has got has given that authority that provider a, a tick of some kind of quality I, I don't think it needs to step into um being a whole managed portal like as has been said above but i just think there's a there's a hole there that uh, there's just blockers to safe data use in our sector in the sector okay yeah noted um yeah it's very it's a fragmented landscape uh from the little investigation i did for those services um we need, we need another standardization project for uh, background checks, but um, anyway. Um, and one thing you mentioned in passing there, Charlie, was about participation data or participant data. Um, is that, in your view, something Open Active would ideally address? It's a very different domain. Uh, oh, um, <laughs> Sporting and priority comes into question, I think, for me, um, uh, in that uh, 
I think there's lots of conversations gone on, gone on about this in the past. I think if 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 there were standards to govern the format of participation data off the back, um, mm. then that presents opportunities to the sustainability of open active. Um, uh, but that would need to be standardized in order for it to be provided um, a sort of in an easy way to then be used. So, so yes, uh, but uh, that feels like more of a sustainability decision than it does a, a technical one. <laughs> right, okay. That's a strategic issue, right. Well, I was yeah, gonna say, also that is a massive can of worms. Uh, is, <laughs> like, you know, in, I mean, like so, so, so many worms, in fact, that we might not see the rest of the screen. Um, so uh, that, that, that would be my only uh, thing on there is just noting that that is a whole different world. And obviously one that there are, there are key players in such as for global that already operate and do some work and they'll be they'll be interested in being part of that there'll be politics around who wants to be engaged and people will feel like they're being undermined their business models undermined etc which is all fine and all stuff that happens um but just we haven't even started to engage those organizations so there's like before we even talk about that there's a journey of to do that at a sector level properly uh would, would require some stuff not saying it shouldn't necessarily do it um, but also just in terms of proving value and things like that, um, it, it potentially, we need to be really clear about where, where we're drawing the lines, I suggest, but it's more of a strategy question between where the value comes from that keeps everybody engaged and then the activities we're doing. Because for example, we go off and do load of participation data work, but actually doesn't actually generate value in a tangible way for anybody that, that, that you know, affects growth or whatever else the metrics are, then obviously we could um, find ourselves mm -hmm. Uh, stranded on an island of uh, lots of politics and no uh, momentum, which is not the place we want to necessarily be in the middle of uh, in the middle of phase four. Uh, I, but uh, yeah, I'd yeah. agree. However, every conversation I seem to have at the moment, all of a sudden, does come back to participation data. It got brought up with twenty-two active partnerships on a call that I was in yesterday, and all of them were kind of chomping at the bit to have access to that information. Um, so the Sorry, Jason. Yes, the, absolutely. So the, the issue is, I think everybody wants that, but how we develop an infrastructure that supports it, because it can't be open data, it's got to be shared data. And if it's shared data, then it needs to be, there needs to be intermediaries that manage that. And then, for example, such as those that exist, and others that might need to come along and do that same service, maybe people on the call be interested in being that intermediary. But it, we can't just create endpoints that then give those active partnerships a solution if you see what I mean there's got there's a bunch of stuff in the middle that needs to be created or existing people engaged and also some of those active partnerships already pay for that service from um, existing organizations that 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 to achieve the same thing so we're, we're kind of we're, we're doing a combination of reworking what's already there combined with for example um, a lot of organizations have got uh, a full global integration currently so they'd be building this alongside that and so we need to make sure there's another for global, I guess, competitor in the middle who would use that's the new standard and present the information and all the other things that come with it uh, in a way that those active partnerships would then want to use and all that would need to be agreed and it would need to be someone's business priority to make that happen. Um, because if we just publish a load of data and no one uses it, obviously we know what happens. <laughs> from previous uh, experience, it, 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 feel, it feels like because I, I, I agree on both sides. It is a it is a can of worms. It is going to be a political my, uh, absolute mind, minefield. That, but equally, I, if we're talking about phase four, it would be a miss of us in uh, the role of phase four to have not. I guess it not be on the agenda of of exploration for sustainability, and and so it feels like a kind of in the there is a gap obviously that we're we're aware of, but it feels like an, an executive and board level agenda item that should be there, um, because if it's not, we're missing a major point. I think I completely agree with everything you've said, Nick, um, and I think there are moving parts in the sector, but equally at a macro level, at a political level, um, if that data were to exist in a market fair way, it would potentially transform the role of open active i think if that's not yeah. too big a statement absolutely as assuming that we don't lose open active because we don't deliver any other value and generate any growth because if we don't get if we don't yeah. get more growth so I, I think what we're having right now is that board level discussion yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's not a, it's not a technical thing i think so yeah. we're, that we firmly agree right now yes 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 exactly that exactly yeah. that so yeah, so I think the action came out very clearly there, which is yeah, I think this this is definitely an issue that goes before the executive come come the day. Um, it needs to be flagged as both both central and 
and difficult. And yeah, we can we can go from there. Um, I guess my only, my only final point, and sorry, Tim, is um, on a similar question of value. I, I can't say this is coming from a naive point, and I don't like making naive points because I sometimes put my foot in it. Um, but uh, just wonder on the short to medium term value of the membership's work in terms of who that um, who the end user benefit is there in the community. Um, I think I know the drivers to that area of work, but if it's not going to drive growth in open active um, in the short to medium term, the, the value of that versus the risk of not doing it and growth being hindered in phase five. Yeah, so Jamie, uh, Jay, um, Charlie, even uh, Jamie asked a similar question on this. I didn't respond the last time it came up in a call, and so I, I'll, I'll say it now. Um, the reason, from our perspective, why uh, memberships is key is because there are there are systems and operators such as Gladstone that are blocking. The, the booking work on the basis of memberships um okay. and so it's becoming it's, it's it's become a prerequisite to turning booking on at scale uh which is i 100 percent agree we would be nowhere near it uh if it wasn't a prerequisite to seeing seeing that kind of scale from our, from our point of view um, but makes, actually, makes, makes total sense so i guess it comes down it'll come down to priorities and the value of um of the evidence of them moving forward with memberships and if not and, all, and then being the only ones potentially versus what other priorities there might be in the value of doing something else. Um, okay, so that's that's an interesting point. Um, again, I feel like we're sort of strategic more than technical here, but um, I had understood memberships to be a kind of glue that we're holding initiatives like MCR Active or Active Westminster kind of together, that this was sort of a lingua franca for the different organizations involved. Is that not the case? Is it is it that there's a few organizations that want that and others that aren't bothered? Or is it a universal concern in those contexts? Sorry, yes. So be, to be totally uh, clear and, and holistic in, in the answer, uh, I was talking to Charlie's specific concern, but yes, holistically, everyone who's an MCR Active, Active Westminster and Greater Manchester and all the others that are looking at that, that type of use case, absolutely memberships is required central and from their perspective, if they're on the call, they would argue it's pointless to do open active without it. Um, and from an operator perspective, if you've got the membership model being central to their business, it's pointless to do open active without it. So talking about operators, talking about that local authority world, yes, very central and therefore a prerequisite to making open active work in that context and the data then being available to other use cases such as uh, Playfinder, uh, sorry, Playways, um, et cetera, et cetera. So obviously there's the, the, there's an interaction between that world and everything else. So I suppose talking to Charlie's point from a kind of long tail perspective, you know, of, of small, smaller providers, memberships isn't really something that's on their radar from what, you know, we're aware of. There's no blockers, no one's saying we need to have memberships before we can do, you know, anything in that in that area. So um, it's it's not going to block getting more long tail data available. Um, and, and it's not going to block a lot of use cases around that long tail data. Um, so I suppose if you've got like two stacks of you've got you've got your all your local authority and local and activities and and partners and all that on one side and you've got all the tail stuff on the other, they can independently work um, and uh, obviously one can be completely blocked into a membership and the other one will just crack on. The point where we've got membership, then both can interact and and everything moves forward. I, I'd actually that was really well summarised, Nick. Oh, well done, <laughs> very good. <laughs> uh, I think there's actually a, a, a sort of interdependency between two things and two parts of the community. So memberships does feel very um, tied to local authority and operator world, and where the benefit value is, both benefit to them, value to the the initiative. Equally, I'd suggest that maybe not quite to the same extent, but safeguarding and qualifications that prior conversation to the tail. Um, in that, I think there are volumes of data, small data users and small data providers publishers who um there's a there's a the connection between those two might be sort of primed on that concept uh, the idea of a, a school being able to connect with or publish the data of all the local providers within their their ecosystem and um, that might be too difficult if they can't guarantee safety of their parents and young people um and so safeguarding and safety being really important there and potentially being a similar blocker to a potential high volume of data so yeah. you've got two completely different worlds there both right at each end of the spectrum i'd agree charlie definitely memberships for the head uh safeguarding for the tail let's do it let's do, let's, let's do both that's the phase four slogan now okay um, <laughs> <laughs> done and uh, leagues and competitions just boringly slap bang in the middle yeah <laughs> <laughs> we'll draw a spectrum absolutely um <laughs> Okay. Um, thank you for that. That was extremely useful. I think unpacking, uh, I think we started the further exploration quite well there. And I think at a, like a 
a usefully general level. Um, so I think we can we can kick off phase four getting a better steer on those and be better placed to to address those. Um, given that we've already uh, drawn out the conversation quite broadly, I guess with um, two minutes on the call, um, is there anything missing from that previous summary? Um, what are the what are the sort of unknown unknowns or what are the concerns that are hovering out there that maybe we've just completely missed in the program in phase three? You can't make a decision on that last slide until you've got Sports England priorities. <laughs> yeah. Is that the unknown unknown? <laughs> I suppose it's a known unknown. Isn't it's it? a known unknown. Yeah, sorry. I was, um, that was untimely and unhelpful. <laughs> or maybe timely and unhelpful. <laughs> I'll reiterate that we can edit these recordings. So. Uh... <laughs> Oh, true um, god um but yeah is there just what what hasn't been on our radar i guess if there if there should be other items i think there's going to be an interesting question if and this is a big if we do manage in phase four to achieve scale in terms of you know booking and all the rest of it then there might be some interesting things that come out of that you know participate particip participation data and all that kind of stuff maybe uh comes out of that um, if if we manage to achieve that scale, and, and then there's actually enough stuff happening that's useful to record, um, and um, I wonder whether then there might be some questions about scaling that we actually hit. I mean, that's that's mm. a a good problem to have if we hit that in the next year. I don't know if we would, but you know, things like making sure that we've got CDNs, maybe making sure that the the specification and the documentation actually, you know, really include that as a kind of core piece of. Uh, you know, we, hmm. all that all that stuff's baked in from the beginning. Um, although some of that's really there to the extent, I suppose. Um, but then other things like that, I suppose. It's, hmm. it's there's one thing getting this working in theory, and there's another thing getting it working at scale. Um, and so there might that might happen depending on you know what you know further pilot conversations, big operators that might move these kind of things that might generate that big big scale. Who knows? Um, th th this this might be uh, put the cat amongst the pigeons. I'll see who this riles, riles first or excites first, or one, of, one of negative or positive. Uh, I think phase four is going to be the emergence of uh, the open active marketplace or marketplaces that uh, that push open active forwards. Um, and that brings into question whether there should be any technical involvement in what a marketplace looks like and shows uh, data sets that include things like the name of your system, the description, the offer offers the pricing um, I think that's going to grow very rapidly over the next few weeks and months and whether there should be any sort of a help help of the community that sits around open active to shape what those sort of uh, say and how the uh, descriptions and uh, and communication is standardized and made fair and all, all those other things um, uh, I don't think we've ever looked at thought about it from a technical perspective but I think there'll be a marketplace and several marketplaces in the market in the next few weeks yeah, I was going to say, um, actually, the EMD marketplace um, that we had some involved, involvement in does have some JSON, of course it does, some open data underneath it uh, that is roughly formatted um, in a kind of, it was started out with an attempt to match schema.org and then kind of due to time constraints, it gave up a bit. But, um, but yeah, there's, yeah, that's, there's, there's a startup for something there if we did want to look at standardizing uh, what an offer looks like. I mean, to be honest, I think Schema's got most of this anyway. Products, offers, all the stuff. It would probably, probably be quite simple to pull something together and then uh, create something around it, at least as a, a basic thing. I'm not sure how much value it adds more generally, mind, in terms of priorities versus you know memberships and uh, and um, the other one, the slogan, uh, so safeguarding. Uh, membership and safeguarding, yeah. So I, I wouldn't necessarily put it up there with those, but something to mention. I did have, uh, I mean, this marketplace conversation has been brought up several times um, and I had spoken to MCR Active about theirs and they did say if we were to create one centrally, they would just use ours. Um, so maybe we could kind of you know, pull one together that would work or fit purpose for everyone rather than so many of them being created, but they could link to us. So it is a conversation to be taken further forward, I would say. And yeah, my comments there, uh, so that wasn't unhelpful, definitely focused on like the uh, the parity between all the different marketplaces, nationally, regionally, locally, because if the, we end up with 200 and they've all got different stuff on them at different levels of, of quality, that just be, get a bit messy very quickly. Okay, so we've got this sort of more like meta concern in a way um, about representing open active as a, as a commodity. Um, 
Okay, that is a useful note, I think, to close on, um, unless anyone's got anything urgent they wish to throw into the mix. And in fact, we're a little over time. Uh, so I'll say thank you very much for the call. Thank you for participating in phase three. I look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks for phase four. Um, I'll circulate um, some terms of reference for phase four in advance of the next call and um, look forward to talking then. Thank you very much.